You feeling good? I am. You don't even know I love this. I love this format. So this is You don't even know what I'm gonna ask you. No, I don't, but I love this that, format. That's exciting. It is. <laughs> I'm ready, baby. Okay. Okay. Step number one. Here we are. You have thoughts about current events based on biblical prophecy. Yes. This is like a major subject. Absolutely. Not only a major subject in the scripture, how yes. they interpreted prophecy based on real life events at their time. Mm -hmm. But it's also been an uh, interest historically in the Christian church looking at biblical prophecy and current events back and forth. Yes. So famous statements, Barth, I believe, said. Go for it. Well, he's going to say, I, I, he said, every good theologian or great theologian uh, has a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. So even mediocre mediocre theologians like me do that so when you're called into that space so uh yeah absolutely okay based on current events situation in ukraine obviously that's what everyone's talking about and um, not to be cliche but just starting off what are what are your initial thoughts regarding the situation in the country of ukraine with russia certainly you know just backing up just for a second even in discussions like this, there are things that, what's the term that Hollywood uses? Evergreen. So regardless of how we see the immediate future or even the intermediate future, long future play out, there are things we're sharing tonight that have value when we look at the Word of God and what's happening in current events. And, sure. And I'm saying that too, Brent, because you and I could sit here and have a discussion on previous current events that people made audacious statements about and connected you know whimsically to some biblical scripture and they came out to be completely you know really irrelevant or wrong false yeah so i want to make sure that i understand you know really understand that foundation so why don't we start here what is the secular geopolitical issue in ukraine what is happening is vladimir putin believes that the greatest tragedy in human history was the breakup of the Soviet Union. And he expressed that to President Bush back in, I think, 2008. He has made insinuations and alluded to this from time to time. And it's kind of like that moment that some things happen geopolitically around the world that are opening the door uh, for Russia, led by Putin, to make some of the moves that he is. And I think, Brent, it, it does a great disservice to not look at some of the things from the West side, NATO side, that the word, you know, I'll use is culpability. Uh, I don't say that in some way to, to suggest equality to what Vladimir Putin is doing with invasion, uh, devastating suffering going on in the Ukraine. I'm, I'm not saying that as a way to justify that at all. Uh, I think I will go back and go back to your original really good question too. Do I personally believe these events have an impact on the literal futuristic view of biblical prophecy and are leading us somewhere? I absolutely sure, do. Sure, and we'll, we'll get there. For most people that are listening, number one, don't understand history of Ukraine. Yes. Not turning this into a history lesson, but um, don't understand the nature of NATO. Yes. Right? The threat of NATO pushing up against Vladimir Putin's yes. doorstep by Ukraine talking about joining NATO, putting nuclear weapons in their country. A thousand percent. Right? So Vladimir Putin acting in, from his perspective, the best interest of his country. Yes. Right? Now they're in Ukraine as of today, March 2nd, possibly getting close to the taking of Kiev, the yes. capital. Yes. Most likely that's what's going to happen. What do you see taking place geopolitically next? I think a couple of scenarios are going to are going to play out. I do not believe and I pray I'm dead wrong. I don't believe it stops here at all. Uh, I, I think this is a stepping stone, a first domino, a first domino to fall that Vladimir Putin believes several other Eastern European countries are going to fall, either succumbing to Russian soft power, certain things, cyber attacks, uh, s certain uprisings, or literal war, you know, hard power expressing more military might. Uh, certainly there are other arguments we could look at right now to suggest uh, that wouldn't happen. Uh, I, I think, Brent, I think the vacuum of power is, is the key thing here because Russia, I believe, is going to continue at least to attempt 
to continue to move and reclaim space of the former Soviet republics. There's another scenario, too, where it's what if Vladimir Putin falls from power and there is a major upheaval, this whole thing turns around. There's some evidence that I'm not suggesting that's going to su- suggesting that's going to happen, but it could. I think biblical prophecy ties in is that whether the first scenario happens and that could lead to world war uh, or the latter, it's going to create a vacuum of power that biblical entities listed in the Bible are so you, going to fill. Yeah. So now I, so I know you, so I know where this is going, but yes. what, sorry, yeah, back me up here. Nope. It's fine. What we need to do though is say, okay, for those who think Russia has a significant role or a primary role yes. in end times biblical prophecy, what would you have to say to those individuals that are looking at the events that are taking place with the rise of Russia? Yes. Considering this is a sign of the end times, what would you say in response to individuals marking Russia as the Gog, Magog yes. category of end times, which is in some circles a traditional view of Russia in end times prophecy? 100%. So, it what is. synopsis? What's your response to that position? It's a very timely question because today a very prominent ministry, a uh, large media ministry, came out and actually mapped some scenarios based on Ezekiel 38 and 39 that had Rosh from Ezekiel th- uh, 39.1, which re- means chief or prince, using it more as like a personal name and a personal identity, identifying that word with Russia it does not identify Russia. It does not mean Russia couldn't end up being part of this union, all these nations that are going to be unified and come against Israel that Ezekiel 38 and 39 list. It's possible. It's just that they are not the primary player, I believe. Uh, I think there's clear indication uh, listing tribes, uh, things we can learn from the ancient Near East. And actually, if we had... Uh, the Holman Bible Atlas, Moody Bible Atlas, Zundervan Bible Atlas, and looked at these designated tribes at Ezekiel 38 and 39 lists, you'll see that the primary player is not Russia. Okay, so your response to this perspective, end times, Russia, Russia rising, this is what we need to look for, it's happening now. Your response is that's actually not the case. Would you say that possibly what is happening in the Russia Ukraine situation is creating a new playing field by which that end time scenario rises out of like like a vacuum type of situation yeah. so taking it from that perspective what is what is that situation how does an escalation in the Russia Ukraine NATO conflict how does that conflict as it increases create a new space for what would be an end time scenario? Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me back up just real quickly because I didn't fully answer your your question. Hal, in the previous question, Hal Lindsey wrote a famous book, The Late Great Planet Earth, 50 plus years ago. There is still great value in that book. He did identify certain tribes from Ezekiel 38 and 39 as being uh, r- indicative of tribal areas, geography of Russia. We now know that those views are really incorrect. And when I say that, I'm not slighting Hal at all. I think he got the ball moving in a very powerful way. Millions of copies sold, bringing people's attention to biblical prophecy. A lot of profit, um, benefit in the biblical scholarship came from popularizing a subject that was buried under the rubble, like Josiah finding scrolls, right? Absolutely. This was a great push forward in um, raising awareness and bringing people's attention to the idea of, The Bible really does say a lot about the things of the end, and we should pay attention to those things. Absolutely, and especially since 1948, when David Ben-Gurion stood up and said, we are a nation once again, the nation of Israel was reborn, just as the Old Testament told us would happen. Uh, In fact, I've been told that on various, I guess there's a, and correct me here, there's a a schedule of uh, preaching through the Torah and the prophets that the synagogues held to around the world. Sure. And that very day that the first prime minister of Israel stood up and said, we're a nation once again, all throughout the synagogues around the world, they were reading, I believe, Amos chapter 9, I will repair the fallen breach of David, which coincides with Ezekiel 37, 
the Valley of Dry Bones and the initial bringing back physical restoration of Israel. Brent, those all, all those things have happened. It's a literal fulfillment 70, 80 years roughly uh, from our time that is ushering in that super, it's the super sign to lead us into these events happening right now being very important. And the vacuum being created, go back to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. I am God. I make known the end from the beginning. The end from the beginning. So what was the beginning like? Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, today, Israel and Islam. It's Islam that's going to fill the vacuum in the areas of these tribes listed, these geographic regions, like Ezekiel 38 and 39 list. It is Islam that is going to dominate those regions. So because historically the nations, the tribal people, and the names listed yes. regarding biblical prophecy in the Old Testament prophets, because those are inhabited now, by Arab people, Muslim people who yes. practice Islam, looking forward, the assumption is that these are Muslim people and that their attack against Israel, which is part of the major storyline of end times prophecy, yes. they've expressed um, their intent and their desire to take Israel. Yes. This is um, something that unifies. It's It's agreed upon by major world powers in the muslim world yes that this is the goal this is what they want to do so because of these things you're saying it wouldn't be as much a russian issue but russia would um, create a new environment that islam would arise out of yes uh, as we see the i believe what's possible the further breakup of Russia or mm -hmm. the former Soviet Union. Now here we have a scenario Russia is advancing in the Ukraine and but you have so many other republics that uh, several of them have very large uh, is Islamic Muslim populations. Some of them are independent states now too that are, are almost fully Muslim. So there that that unity that unity through that belief system is really trumping the fact that you have a very large geographical area area in russia you have a declining russian population you have a lot of uh rising tide some some a large generation of the current russian population has only known vladimir putin as the ruler of the country yeah he came into power what 1999 2000 mm -hmm. yeah and then 2002 he was even very much speaking in terms of we don't want to get in any problems with america yes. right it was very very nonchalant in terms of military conquest so one of the things to take into consideration is how do we biblically substantiate the case that um, the end times Gog and Magog scenario is Muslim in nature. I know that one way to approach that or to look at that is from the Central Asia argument, right? Yes. So you have yes. um, Gog, Magog in, in the northern yes. that's coming down. That would be possible that it's Central Asia, not just Russia, and which is predominantly Muslim, right? It's a Muslim area, yes. right? For those who don't know, Central Asia is like the stands, right? The yes. Kazakhstans and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. Yes, or there has the to be sleeping, another one. Yeah, there is Uzbekistan. I said that one. He did shoot. Uh, it's all Pakistan, right. of course. That's much more well known. More, more well known. So in this area of Central Asia, coming down, very very possible that they play a major major role because across the sea from Turkmenistan, you have. Yes. Azerbaijan, Georgia. Yes. And then connected on the other side is the Balkans and the Turkey. nation of where you've got Syria, Moldova, Turkey. You've got Tur well, excuse me. I'm going I'm getting ahead yeah. of myself. Yeah. So going too far. Turkey straight across. How could I forget that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Turkey straight across the water from Turkmenistan. It's yes. separated by a few a few countries. Armenia, that's, yes, that's why the Armenian problem, when I say Armenian problem, I mean the Armenians are not a problem when you be praying for those people. Yeah, They're Armenian under siege by Azerbaijan and, and Turkey. Right. And 
the nations you just listed in Central Asia, which is really a sleeping giant that is arising, they are not just united to Turkey by religion. They're related, they're related by origins. Yeah, they're ethnicity. Tur- yeah, they're Turkish, Turkish peoples. Right. So it's a really double barrel in, in an alignment and alliance to um, follow what many of them believe is going to be the coming of the Mahdi, the, the Islamic savior who is going to unite the world uh, for the betterment uh, of Islam. But that is not going to be the betterment for the world or certainly the Christian or Jewish world. So from a biblical substantiation, right, how do we say clearly these biblical prophecies regarding the end times are not referring to European Russians, but are referring to Muslims, Turkish people, yes. Arab people. Um, like, give some specifics regarding sure. where in biblical prophecy does it talk about tribes or nations or people that when you look on a map, like you've mentioned, reputable sources, yes. Zondervan and Holman, others, yeah. right, yes. that they point to that geography, which is the modern day Arab world, yes. where the biblical prophecies are speaking of the key actors, really the main actors. And where, why this is important is out of those main actors arise the main actor, yes. the Antichrist, the little horn, Gog, the yes. leader of Magog, yes. right? So man of sin, all the same person. Which the Arab beliefs, the Muslims and their Quran believe in Jaj and Majaj, right? They believe in the Gog and Magog yeah, character did. and features also. So yes. first, what just what are some scriptural references for people who are, are thinking like, I've heard of Russia, there's a lot of popularization right now about Russia and the Antichrist. A lot. Well, sure, and it's, you know, of course that's what's going to come up because it's what's happening, you know, in real life, in the news. But what is the biblical evidence names scripture references for the well, Islamic argument. Let's definitely stay in the zip code of, of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Let's take Ezekiel 38 and reiterate it many, many, uh, in several ways in, in 39. You've got Gog, which means ruler of Meshach and Tubal. And referring back to those atlases like Zondervan Holman, uh, referring to the fact that those are tribal regions in Turkey. If Hal Lindsey, you've heard me say this before, I have a book that I've showed you, The Greatness That Was Babylon by H.W. Mm-hmm. Sags. It was heralded. Sags. Sags. It was heralded by the Washington Post, I think New York Times. Great ancient Near East scholar. And it was written in 1962 or 63. And in there, he just says it so plainly and clearly in, in certain sections that Meshach and Tubal are regions of what we, we call and identify with as modern day Turkey. It's not Russia. And the very word for north in several areas is Safan. It's, it's literally named for a mountain in the, uh, what was considered in the Jewish context, the utter north. And that's a mountain essentially on the border of Syria and Turkey. So even the word to identify the term north is a mountain that geographically today is essentially on the border of Syria and Turkey. So more and more, when you look at the features of biblical prophecy in the Old Testament, we don't just find references to the Arab world or to the Middle East in general. Like yes. Common knowledge, pretty fair. Babylon is yes. Iraq, right? Yes. We don't. We know that the Middle East plays in the ancient Near East plays a major role in the history of the Bible does going back to the book of Genesis with, you know, Babel and in the tower and um, Nimrod. We, these things are generally agreed upon. Yes. But when you look at biblical prophecy and the specifics of the actors in the end times, it's not just the Arabs or Islam in the Middle East or the Muslims, but it's really centered and focused around the country of Turkey. Yes, it is. So Turkey is a country that's a land bridge, essentially, between Asia and the Middle East, West Asia and Europe. Yes. And it's super significant in terms of its geopolitical significance. One of the most geopolitically unique countries in the entire world. So there are plenty of references and we, you know, we don't really need to get into them right now for just the general pointing to the Middle East for end times locations in biblical prophecy. But what points more so specifically at the nation of Turkey? 
the certainly those references uh, talking about Meshach and Tubal. That's Ezekiel thirty-eight, 38 and, verse one. Uh, yes, and okay. and it's some I don't uh, and, and some of the uh, some of the same verbiage is used in in thirty-nine. Uh, I think an, another an, not the only one, but another uh, way to look at another passage to Daniel chapter eight when we look at this ram he goat war and uh, verses 17, 19, and 26 in Daniel chapter 8 tell us that the vision that Daniel has seen, clearly the context says it's for the very end of the very end, the very the time of wrath. And this begs the question, how can that be completely or utterly, utterly fulfilled in totality by looking 2,500 years back in history and looking at the Greek-Persian wars that certainly are being referenced uh, in in a historical context and what Daniel sees, but yet it also has another fulfillment or continued fulfillment that's going to have a crescendo at the end because of the very context of Daniel chapter 8 tells us, well, it's for, for the very end of the very end. Right. Not something that happened 2,500 years ago. And the ram is shown in Susa. That's modern day um, Iran, Persia, and then the he goat. It's said from Javan or Yavan, and often that's referred to as the tribal area of Greece. Like Meshach and Tubal are part of Turkey, Yavan of of Greece. Except Yavan doesn't just mean Greece; it means what we would call Asia Minor or Western Turkey, where we would find essentially all seven churches in Revelation two and three of the Book of Revelation. Another would this, would this be like in Daniel where it talks about um, the Prince of Grisha? Yes. So like Grisha represents a, a much larger landmass yes. than just modern day Greece. Yes, it, it represents does. this this expansive landmass moving in to Turkey, and so building on this. The nations that are mentioned are not just limited to Turkey. Yes. Some of them, like Put, mm -hmm. right, Kush, mm -hmm. like Libya, Chad, Libya, yeah, Chad, Northern Africa, Ethiopia, Kush. right. Mm -hmm. So these nations are not just Turkey and some of the Middle East, but branch south and across the northern rim yes. of Africa. So when when we look at that expansive nature of the Old Testament prophecies of what the end times confederacy it's a confederacy Great of word. nations magog right yep what that actually looks like on a map from northern africa up into the middle east and across the land bridge of turkey when you look at that on a map what does that same grouping of countries northern africa middle east across turkey heading into europe what other map besides biblical prophecy in the end times map what else does that look like it it looks like what we would call the eastern leg of the roman empire in a lot of sense historically it also dovetails practically completely the ottoman empire that's the inheritor of the eastern leg they de essentially defeated the byzantine empire took over constantinople it's known now today as is istanbul the capital of turkey capital of turkey you know certainly the western leg we rome in italy it fell much earlier than constantinople or istanbul today which ruled over mina middle east north africa the region you're referring to for hundreds of years and then to your point this magog definition that really starts to line up really well with some of the Scythians, which does go into the caucasus region a little bit of that southern rim of russia which again are uh, strong Muslim uh, identities and also out towards Central Asia. So here you have even a broader, I believe a broader scope, this Neo-Ottoman Empire, this new Ottoman Empire that will form this Islamic Caliphate headquartered in Turkey, Gog, the ruler of Meshach and Tubal, Tubal, ruler of Turkey over all these other nations, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 list. And coming back around, let's just briefly back to Ukraine, Gomer is listed in these two chapters. Where is Gomer? Well, it's it's inconclusive. There's some good insights looking at Germany, certain areas of Eastern Europe, and also evidence that supports Germany through the Ukraine. And who is helping the Ukrainians right now in their conflict 
with Russia, even though Turkey is playing both sides of the fence. You've got Bayraktar devastating TB2 drones, military drones, attacking Russian personnel uh, and artillery uh, mechanized units right now in Ukraine. Those come from Turkey. And they've been in Ukraine for some time on the border long before the conflict. We've seen videos of the the drones flying across the trenches. Yes. Right. And that that was months ago. Yes, it was. Turkey was on the border supplying Ukraine with at least drone support that we know of from pretty early on. And so when you have biblical prophecy showing a block of countries, Northern Africa, Middle East, pressing almost into Europe, you have historically the Ottoman Empire basically mirroring this same map layout, the same group of countries. Yes. What else is significant in that group of countries? Is this something that um, could be revived? Is this something that um, is still drawn on maps with any kind of future projection? Do world leaders refer to this same group of countries um, like Russia refers to the old Soviet Union and wanting to redraw the map of Europe, right? Like this expansionist hegemony, this idea Um, Not just on the European side with Russia saying, you know, we're trying to gain back land that was lost, right? This year, 2022 being the centennial of the Soviet Union from 1922. Yes. And, you know, there's two things that I think we need to talk about. Number one is our leaders in the Middle East talking about this same kind of map in future planning. Is that a thing? And number two, what significant dates particularly with turkey are coming up that have a major political influence into what they're legally allowed to accomplish yes great questions uh certainly over the last decade or two just like to your earlier point vladimir putin has continued to ramp up a strategic goal that he wants to achieve sure. that we're unfortunately seeing right now the leader of Turkey, President Erdogan, has also declared various strategic goals to rebuild the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in, in some ways, some of these areas and lands that we're talking about, and when I say this, the people in these regions, I'm not saying it's like there's some kind of commodity. You know, you and I are here to look to use biblical prophecy as a way to get the truth of the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ to the, these regions uh, of the world, and, and, and then some. But both of these two leaders, Erdogan and Putin, just want to dominate as hegemons over these regions. You know, it, it's, it might be shocking when we really look at the power of Turkey, when you're looking at their military forces and proxies in Libya, in Syria. Second largest in NATO. Second largest army in NATO in, in helping in the Ethiopian conflict, in Iraq. They're also closing off water, the, the headwaters of various rivers and tributaries from from the higher ground in Turkey. Well, the based on Erdogan's whim, you know, those those water resources flow or they don't. You know same within Ethiopia, they're funding the GERD, largest dam in the world. That's they, major problem for those surrounding countries. They are. We off we, we see this battle between Sudan and especially Egypt and Ethiopia about wait a minute, Ethiopia, you just can't, you know, all of a sudden be off shooting all of these the headwaters in the blue and white Nile that flow eventually through Egypt because ninety percent of uh, of the Egyptian population re- re- you know yeah. relies on the Nile. Egypt but has a major water problem. Big time water problem. There might be some biblical prophecy related to that, too. That's another time. Hmm. But uh, with that said, to your point, Turkey got Qatar or Qatar to help fund the project. See, no one's looking at who's instigating all this. Erdogan is. And if I was to tell you that who who I believe has the most consulates or diplomatic representation in Africa, you we might say America or China. But I think right there who possibly a country that has surpassed those two nations or certainly right there in the conversation is Turkey because they seek to be the dominant power. They seek these Quietly. lands again. Yes, so just like Vladimir Putin is trying to retake the former Soviet republics and bring the Soviet Union back to glory, I would like to make a case that the poster child for this successful movement, which neither one I'm, I'm advocating for, is Turkey and Erdogan. So 
if you look at the countries that are mentioned in biblical prophecy and you look at Vladimir Putin and his goals to redraw the Soviet Union, that's referring to a totally different landmass. Yes. Right. It's referring to the other side of Eurasia. Yes, it is. It's not referring to the Middle East and the nations that are mentioned in biblical prophecy. Correct. You have originally mentioned in the book of Ezekiel and other places. You have the original Ottoman Empire yes. that matches. And you have the president of Turkey talking about the revival of the Ottoman Empire and uniting the Muslim and Arab world under a new caliphate. And yes. is there evidence or has President Erdogan of Turkey presented maps of what the revived Ottoman Empire would look like? Y yes, he has. Maybe not as dramatic well actually let me go back he just celebrated a map that basically shows the turkic empire uh stretching from north africa through the middle east all the way through central asia and he celebrated that as this is the future of uniting a turkic muslim peoples and uh you know going back previously talk you you looked at historically a hundred years ago some things that happened yeah i think you're referring to after world war one a very key war that re helped reshape really get the ball rolling for reshaping the middle east because some of these treaties that turkey was on the wrong side of of world history in that case they were aligned with the powers that lost in, in germany being the most prominent and their territories got broken up. The Ottoman Empire was broken up. The British defeated them in the Middle East theater of war during World War I and certain treaties to kind of uh, wrestle control in some ways from Turkey, like the Treaty of Severus, Treaty of Lusain. These are coming up, have, have passed or are coming up on their 100th anniversary. And Erdogan has been very talkative over the years to say, we are going to change these treaties and really putting date setting into a glorious new Ottoman world that I would like to suggest should have our ears up to what the Bible says it really is referring to. So what are Turkey's current limitations legally from initiating war or initiating any type of conflict perspective based on those treaties? Is there any kind of expiration because all of these world leaders like Putin and others, they're, they're doing things on legal grounds, yes. even like NATO. NATO is not just going into Ukraine because Article 5 says that that really only takes place for a NATO country that's being invaded. And Ukraine isn't. So yeah. these actors on the world stage are moving and making decisions based on legality. Yes. So when it comes to Turkey, what if there is any legality of limitations on President Erdogan that are expiring in the near future. 2023, I believe, the Treaty of Lusain, um, I, I, that's the one that strongly comes to mind. I think I'd, um, you know, just for, uh, go back and take a, a, another look at that for more particulars. But yes, uh, that's been really centered. The, 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 the dates that come up uh, with Erdogan a lot are 20, uh, 2023, 2030, looking at a uh, transition certainly other dates are mentioned and when i say these things you know you and i are not trying to date set anything we're just looking at the practicality of what their strategic goals yeah, are sure. uh, and so even things like the uh, montreal convention which talks about the bosphorus strait but you know the black sea out into the mediterranean or, or the dardanellas uh, uh, seaways there that is controlled by Turkey there's certain laws on how Turkey cannot have you know utter dominance over uh, that waterway even though they control both ends of it and yet they do have a lot of power and a lot of say in that discussion it's coming up right now because everyone wants Turkey to close the Bosporus Strait to the Black Sea mm -hmm. because regardless of what any type of convention says or treaty the fact that the nation of Turkey controls both sides of it, they want to close it to any ship of their choosing, they can do that. And what's interesting, Brent, is for some reason, Erdogan decides to build another channel, and this is taking up a large swath of territory in Istanbul, the biggest city in Turkey, which basically is creating another isthmus, a, a causeway, to have even more transit of commerce, certainly warships come through another strait right next to the Bosphorus that even many people are saying, why is he doing that? Merchants of the sea. Absolutely. So take us, take us through 
a synopsis to kind of wrap up this first overview introduction um, response rebuttal to the Russia theory take us through what what do the events of end times biblical prophecy actually look like? What is that storyline? I believe very clearly that the Muslim world is in MENA throughout through Central Asia, so Middle East, North Africa, in the areas of Central Asia, and including some areas, how extensive, I'm not sure, the Balkans, possibly further up into Eastern Europe, they will eventually unite. There will be a sultan over the, over the nation of Islam, over the nations of Islam, a caliph who will rule just like they did previously, a long line of different sultans, Suleiman the Great, Salim, etc., from Istanbul, Turkey. Back in that day, it was Constantinople uh, until it became Istanbul. So Turkey will rule everything. And this is interesting, Brent, because just looking and, and just speculating, you know, let's look at something like that's a, that's a, 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 a very can be a very controversial or very wild thing to say what this forthcoming mark of the beast in Revelation, a lot of insinuations what that is. Well, the Bible is clear that it has to do with some image that's going to be erected in a coming temple in Jerusalem. Revelation 11, two witnesses are going to roll in there and tell the whole world what Jesus really thinks of all this, and he's not very happy with it. These are not allegorical. These are literal occurrences that will happen. They're future and they're literal. They will occur. And it, it, the Bible is clear that there will be a united area of these regions of the world that are all Islamic. Many of them have Turkic orientation. In fact, Ezekiel 38 and 39 even list Persia coming under the fold. Right now, uh, that's Iran, modern day Iran. What separates Iran is its Shia Muslim nation. Sunni is by far the predominant sure. um, aspect, denomination, for lack of a better word, of Islam. But Persia eventually, either through war or just going, just going to acquiesce to the coming caliph, or dare I say Mahdi, savior, leader of Islam. So what is, what is Mahdi? When you say Mahdi, what does that mean? It means, in just simple terms, basically the savior of the Islamic world, the, the one who is going to bring peace and blessing upon the whole earth and bring Islamic domination to the earth. So the Mahdi is in Islam, yes. an anticipated Messiah figure. Very much so. Right? Not that they, they do believe, Muslims do believe that Jesus, Isa, was a person. Yes. That he was a prophet, but that the Christian doctrine of his life, death, and resurrection is um, a conflagration. It's not genuine. It's fake. Yes. And they are anticipating in the future a character, an individual, a Mahdi, who is going to kind of right wrongs and um, cause agricultural prosperity yes. and bring peace and like all of these things. So this Mahdi figure is from the Islamic perspective a messiah yes but from a biblical end times prophecy perspective would fit the role of like an antichrist figure and would be viewed maybe in a very genuine sense in both at the same time so from an Islamic well sense said. it would, would be you know, oh, this is him. This is the guy. This is the Mahdi. And from a Christian perspective, it would be this is this is the one that Christ warned us about, that the apostles warned us about. And in Islam and Christianity, we find the same story mirrored many yes. times. And that, to me personally, is one of the strongest um, points of evidence, or one of the, the strongest aspects of considering. The, is the Islamic um, notion of end times biblical prophecy is because how much of the Quran mirrors that of scripture in yes. the Bible and yet it's just telling the opposite story with an opposite ending yes uh, you and I just uh, two or three months ago had the pleasure of having dinner with New York Times best-selling author Joel Richardson great guy great guy you know um, phen phenomenal teaching um, great minister 
and you know he wrote the the New York Times bestselling book that really cast a lot of light on a lot of great teaching that he's offering. Uh, the the title is very provocative: the Islamic Antichrist. The first book that he wrote. Uh, I don't know if it was the first book that he wrote, but I know it was very early, and certainly it it yeah. skyrocketed. I think it was. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and and the evidence, and this is where going back, and I know you and I have talked about, talked about this before too. We are not trying to look at this end game, this biblical end game like somehow saying certain peoples or certain factions are not are un, are irredeemable uh that is not what we're saying we're saying sure. that you know the jewish world uh the secular world the muslim world needs jesus christ and we're to be instruments of of his love sure. and speak the truth in love and it, it is fascinating because uh, i believe i believe that joel's points to, to in this particular case using that book and and biblical references what he's going back to are correct that when we look at the islamic savior of the world he lines up very well with this gog figure man of sin the assyrian little horn antichrist they're all the same person brent they're not different figures and even when you look at uh jesus isa or isa uh who they believe he is boy brent it, what he does and how he interacts sounds a lot like the figure of the false prophet in revelation so in some ways, their Savior and their Jesus to us really line up well, strongly, potentially, with the coming Antichrist and false prophet. And I know that can be very provocative and also very eye-opening well, for many Bible's people. The Bible's provocative. It is. End times is provocative. It You're is. You're talking about slews of people dying under the wrath of God. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to get the message out. It's about eternity. And the Bible is ancient Near East-centric. It's not America-centric. We, we've taken things out of context. We've made fanciful decisions. Uh, interpreting things egocentrically. Yes. Like interpreting things based on where we are in the world, not interpreting things based on the audience and the setting in which they were originally written. Correct. The West is asleep, Brent. Most of us, especially in the church, are asleep. We are to be watchful. We are to be diligent. We have not, we have, for the most part, have not done that. And if I'm pointing a finger at anyone, I got three more pointing back at me because we're the body of Christ. But it is time to wake up. These things are coming like a freight train upon the earth. And also certain topics of tech, technological advancement and things even happening in the Middle East, you know, strange phenomena in the skies. You know, you and, you and I could have another discussion on UAPs, UFOs, unidentified aerial phenomena, unidentified flying objects. Why would I mention those things? Not to try to build some kind of theology around them, but to look at the way the supernatural is starting to explode on the earth right now. Technology and bridging it to some of the things happening in Islam Paranormal. around the world. Paranormal, thank you, better said. And we're not teaching these things, Brent. And I'm telling you, our, especially our younger generation is they being fed. It. They do. They love it. And why are we allowing them to succumb to a non-Christian narrative to explain these things when we have the answers? And that's another diatribe that's I need to stop point. right now. No, it's a great point. And the more that you consider what the text says, the more you're a lover of the Word of God, the more that you're, you love God with all of your heart and you walk in His ways and you want to be pleasing to Him, you're open to and interested in everything that the Word of God says. Yes. And part of the problem is that with the Christian church in the West and our, our modern Christian church, regardless of general biblical illiteracy, yes, like being Bible illiterate, uh, yes. right? Besides this, it's a general issue that can be resolved through pastoring and teaching. There's, there's no doubt about that. But even among those that are biblically literate, which are unfortunately most likely a minority, you have less and less interest in the subject of biblical prophecy unless there's an issue like this Ukraine issue. Yes. And to your credit and Joel Richardson's credit, individuals that have been investigating and devoting their lives and their time to this subject for 20 years, 25 years, it shows that the broad measure of how much information there is yes. in the scripture on this subject, right? Y you would say, since it's in the scripture, it's inexhaustible. Yes. Um, there's enigmatic aspects, mystery involved in it, right? Like yes. the mystery of iniquity, it yes. already works. So 
we know that there are certain levels of mystery. Um, there are certain aspects of the subject that probably we're not going to know for sure. And there are also different ways of interpreting biblical prophecy. Generally, the way that you and I understand biblical prophecy is a literal future aspect. Yes. Right? We, we literally believe that these things will happen in the future. Um, and, and that even has difficulty, just like other modes of interpretation sure. of biblical prophecy. It poses a challenge. So these things sometimes are shied away from because of the complexity. And that's very understandable. But more and more to be able to help people to understand that it is a subject of the Bible. It was a major theme in the teaching ministry of Christ. Yes. It is present in every book of the Bible. We throw ar around words like hope, and we talk about Christian hope without a context of what that actually means regarding the victory of a coming conflict and the resurrection Correct. of the dead. So taking the time to you know pull this apart and analyze this and you know draw out a long thread and say here are some points along a timeline that are significant it helps to build a well-rounded christian mind it helps us to think of our lives now in light of eternity correct and not just in platitudes or nice mm -hmm. sayings and cute phrases on coffee mugs but to really think of ourselves as part of the story of God, active in the redemptive history of God, knowing that what is happening now is under the sovereignty of God and leading somewhere because even God himself sends strong delusion yes, he does. during the time of the Antichrist from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Yes, he does. So this is a part of God's story, and it is not our story. The gospel of Christ is not our gospel. Yes. It is not our story even though paul said my gospel you know attributing it to the sense of uh, his, his his sense of belonging to it, yeah. it, it more so um how it was the story of his life really um, his affinity towards it but this is god's narrative and he's the one who knows the beginning from the end yes he is he's the one who says it in the beginning and it happens that way like isaiah speaks of god and um, yes what it is 48 42 i think it's both Brent, 41, 48, whatever it is. I, I feel, um, you know, the judgment starts in the house of the Lord. First Peter, Peter 4. four. And this, I believe, strongly is where we're at. I'm, I'm going to apply it especially to America. We need to wake up, take repentance seriously, love each other uh, in a way that would help us move in these areas of repentance that God is calling us to, to be very serious and intentional about our faith as we are going to continue to see the great falling away that occurs where the love of many waxes cold. Mm. And I feel like a lot of the topics we could go into an offshoot on this, they have, they're so important and yet they just do not tickle a lot of ears. Biblical prophecy, you know, does usually does that, but we shy away from a lot of that. Uh, we got to get the church focused to your point. The great hope, the blessed hope is eternal. It's not here on this earth. Sure. You know, and, and the hour is so late, I believe, Brent. Daniel closes up his book in Daniel chapter 12 and says some profound things. And there's an encouragement and also something that I believe that should wake us up. Daniel is told that those during this final period of human history who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Does that excite anyone? Because we should be really fired up about that. You know, I mean, even Jesus says in Revelation 3 to Laodicean church, which he has nothing good to say about, and which also dovetails a lot of the American church, but we'll leave it there, uh, says even at the end, if you repent, if you turn, just like I sat down on my father's throne, I will seat you on my throne. Are you kidding me? The glory only goes to Jesus, but he is going to sit us down sure. and his seat? A, sh a shared rulership. Sh Co-heirs, yeah, yes. Correct. That's amazing. Amazing. And then he's told, Daniel is told, seal up the book, Daniel, for many shall go to and fro and knowledge, that word may be best rendered, it also includes knowledge, but it may be best rendered information. Information, knowledge shall vastly increase. People shall go to and fro. We are living in the information age. 
these things that Daniel was told are not something in the far flung future. They are here. They are now. And I'm not dates any when I say that. I'm saying that it's urgent. Sure. Well, it's interesting that um, there is a great apostasy. There is a great falling away. We know that from Second Thessalonians chapter 2 again. And yet, Jesus promised, I will build my church. Yes. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Correct. And having a scope and having the bandwidth to be able to understand and interpret and learn and speak about biblical prophecy helps us to deeper realize more and more that Christ is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail prevail against it correct and this is the picture of the book of revelation a persecuted church who is enduring whether you have a post-millennial all millennial or a pre-millennial view on the book of revelation regardless of your uh, literal figurative interpretations of the symbolism and the narrative of revelation there is no argument that it is written to a persecuted church that in the end does prevail well said that is the story of the gospel and to take that hope and that Christian message and bring it right into the hearts of everyday people, whether they're young, whether they're new to the faith, whether they're scholars in the academic world, yes, uh, if you, even if they're professorial, it does not matter. The Christian message speaks to the heart of um, humans. It speaks to our heart. And to be able to take, and this is really the challenge, I, I think, is to be able to take the information that's in the gospel, the information of biblical prophecy, and to be able to talk about it and present it in such a way that it does awaken, that it does transform, Correct. that it does burn and sanctify, that it does enlighten the eyes of the understanding in a way that only God can do through his word. And that should be our continual pursuit. And it's not just limited to the subject of biblical prophecy but it certainly doesn't exclude that topic either. No, and uh, for whatever reason in God's eternal plan, uh, in a minor sense, uh, I've been called to follow, you know, Karl Barth, um, in a sense, Bible in one hand, newspaper, current events in the other. And uh, that's great. You know, and it is, it's been, it's been a blessing. It's a joy. Uh, it's been a lot of failure on my end, but God is faithful when I haven't been. And that just only propels me more to walk more by the spirit, uh, not by sight, not by the flesh. So um, it's exciting. Yeah. Biblical prophecy, there's plenty to talk about. There's many different things in history, in current events, in the scripture themselves. And yeah, it'll be interesting over time to continue the conversation and see... We, exactly. We probably would do another session down the road and further follow up on what, you probably know, probably sooner than later, yeah, probably, probably Ukraine. We're, we're praying for you and uh, praying for the Russian people too. Brandon, the apostle Paul says, pray for your leaders. And he's referring to Emperor Nero, who looks any leader um, makes basically any leader we've ever known to be almost a, a, a godly representative of themselves sure. of the highest order. Uh, Cause how awful Nero was. We can certainly pray obviously for v- Zelensky, but also Vladimir Putin, Erdogan, that they would turn and come to Christ because that's what it's all about. Sure. All right. Well, I enjoyed it. I did too, bro. Thanks so much. Yeah, for sure. We'll do it again. All right. All right.